Hi, welcome to the Israel First television program, the program that looks at Israel. We look at the news, we look behind the news. And uh, one of the things is, and one of the things that you've asked us about, is the innovations in Israel, the fantastic things that Israel is doing throughout the world, different developments. Well, one of the uh, things that has been done by Israel is solar power. And it's great to have in the studio Yossi Abramovitz. Thank you so much for joining us and giving us your time. Thank you so much because you're a busy man. you're going around the world, so we really appreciate you uh, uh, coming into the studio. And is, you're not going to want to miss any of this. Tell your friends to tune in. Uh, Yossi Abramovitz is originally from Boston in the United States. He's an environmental activist, pioneering global solar power. He's the CEO of en- Energia, uh, uh, the company, multinational renewable energy company, and focused on development and management of large solar fields, which is making such a difference, particularly in Africa. And we know. Uh, that a lot of you are watching uh, from Africa. He's a former candidate for president of of Israel. He's been nominated three times for a Nobel Peace Prize and was listed as one of the most influential uh, Jewish people in the world by the Jerusalem Post. He's spoken at the White House. He's been featured on CNN, CNBC, Bloomberg, Voice of Israel uh, and the New York Times, I believe. (laughs) <laughs> That's what the information is that they give me. <laughs> so thank you so much for joining us today. So first of all, you're not originally from Israel, I guess. You're mm-hmm. not uh, somebody who is born in the country. You're from right. Boston in the United States. So how did a Jewish boy from Boston uh, end up in, uh, in Israel? So um, actually, after the 1967 war, there was this kind of a historic euphoria worldwide because the just, 67 war being the war when uh, Jerusalem was united. War was, was united, right. Exactly. And so my parents in New York were kind of caught up a bit in this historic moment. And they made Aliyah in 1969. We actually came by boat when wow. I was five years old. You were your parents. Uh, yeah, and my, my brother and I as well. So I was five, and that, that left a very nice uh, imprint. We were here for three years. Uh, we went back to the States for my dad to get a PhD. My parents uh, got divorced. and. Uh, you know, the story continued differently, but um, I grew up Jewish. I grew up in a, in a youth movement uh, that was very centered on, on the potential of Israel. Um, and, uh, and I lived here on and off and I've done the do you think Do you think that, um, that's kind of like a normal thing in, in, in America, that Jewish people will be keen on Israel or is it does it vary, or is it certain areas or certain groups? Or? Look, it varies. Uh, we're in a different era today. I mean, th- that was the era of complete underdog. I mean, really little David uh, uh, up against the mighty uh, Goliath. Uh, some of those tables of, you know, at least the narrative uh, has turned. Um, uh, it, I think it's very, very varied uh, because h- half the uh, college kids uh, who are going to college from a Jewish home are products of intermarriage. And so there's also less attachment to Israel when you have... And campuses of, are... Uh, some of the campuses are quite anti-Israel, aren't they? I, that's what I hear from the United States. Yeah, it depends where you go and depends also when you go, right? right. Uh, but it, it's, a, it's a much more complicated... It, it was a simple narrative when I was growing up. Um, and uh, it's so a you more went, complex narrative so, today. So you went back to the United States. As a kid, right. And then you returned at some stage. I came on different, you know, summer and, and uh, year-long program. But uh, I always felt the pull. Um, and uh, at a certain point, my wife said, uh, we have five children, two from Africa. And uh, when kid number five came home, she said, let's take some time out and, and go to Israel for a couple of years. And wow. Um, we had actually, this has been the point of contention in our courtship for seven years. Cause Israel? I wanted, cause, yeah, because I wanted to be here right. and she wanted to be there. So when she suggested it, we grabbed it, and that was 12 and a half years ago. Wow. But I, I, well, I should explain, because it, for, for, for you at home, you might not realize this, but it's quite a big thing, you know. You've got to come from America to live in Israel. Uh-huh. There's the distance there's uh, family ties, there's yeah. business ties. It's yeah. not as simple. It's, you know, a lot of you will think, well, they, they, that's the th- right thing to do. You know, it's the yeah. part of biblical prophecy that Jewish people coming back to the land of Israel. But it's not so simple, there's yeah. f- the, especially with family ties, you know, with elderly relatives. The, the, fa- the family, I mean, that, that's actually the hardest piece of making the move. I, I think also, look, there's, there is the biblical narrative. I mean, it is pretty 
extraordinary to come back after 2,000 years of powerlessness and to keep a dream alive. But, you know, then you're caught up in the day-to-day -day of life. Like, how do you practically make such a thing? So even though that narrative may be there for, you know, most Jews around the world, it, it's not part of their lives in the in the in the day to day. Right. So you came you came to live in you came to live in Israel. Yeah. Now, uh, how did you get involved in solar power? Because this is uh, your your. Some people call you the father of solar power. Uh -huh. I, well, no, Arnold Goldman, uh, may his memory be blessed, is the founding father of solar power. He, was, he lived in our neighborhood in Jerusalem. Uh, the first commercial scale solar field in the history of the world was built by, by Israel in the Mojave Desert in California. In, late in, in America? In America, yeah. Um, what I had the privilege of doing is to bring it to Israel, and it was, it was completely by mistake. We, when we decided to move to Israel, I thought we were gonna move to Jerusalem, uh, but my wife said, let's go as far away from Jerusalem as possible so that we can be with the family, be with the kids. I had been a volunteer 25 years earlier down on the Jordanian border down south. And um, so they welcomed us, us to Kibbutz Keturah, and it was the end of the day, August 24th. Sun was setting. We opened the doors of the air-conditioned van and were hit with the most unbelievable heat. And um, I said, wow, the whole place must work on solar power. And that was really the uh, so how founding moment of the solar industry in the state of Israel. Wow. But how did you know that? Because were you uh, involved in solar power in America? Did you come with this kind of knowledge? Or? Uh, ever since I was a kid, I actually, uh, I remember the uh, oil boycott from um, the, the Yom Kippur War, 73, 74. My bedroom was above a gas station, wow. uh, overlooking a gas station. And I remember the long line of cars, and it was because enemies of Israel uh, were, were penalizing the United States at the time for its support of they Israel the, during the, the supplies Kippur up War. to the States, yeah. Yeah, and um, so I remember being interested in it. I had a wonderful science teacher, uh, Evelyn Lang, uh, which also helped. So I've always been interested in solar power. I'm not a scientist. I like to get things done, like on the ground, that sort of make things happen in the world. Um, but, so I had an, a scientific affinity with solar, but it's a little bit less about technology than it is right. about uh, the revolution. Right. <laughs> so you you um, you were at the kibbutz, yeah. And then uh, how did that how did that go from from your discovery that it's very hot to that <laughs> we and no solar power to yeah. to actually installing uh, a solar uh, and you do it commercially, yeah. I should explain. Yeah. Uh, for, for you at home, it's not. Uh, we're not talking about one or two on a roof. We're talking about f whole um, fields. Power plants. Power right. plants. This right. is it. Um, so when on the first day they said there's no solar power, and I was like, how could there be? And the second day I was like, well, I wonder if the region has any. And they're like, no, no, nothing going on in the region. And the third day I was like, wait, I thought Israel was a world leader on something to do with the technology. And they said, yeah, but no one's crazy enough to take on the government. Right. So we formed the Arava Power Company with uh, the kibbutz and a partner in uh, the States. Uh, and I thought it was going to be a simple journey because the land is there. There's no water. The sun is there. And so the you, is you, there. you had a project to put a solar field in, yeah. in this kibbutz that you'd visited. Yeah. You had the idea to put a solar field on. I thought so, it would be really simple because you can see it right there. And right. The sun is beating down. It took us five years to win 100 political, regulatory, and statutory battles wow. so that the business model would work and that we could begin. But that day that we cut the ribbon, wow. glorious, glorious. Fantastic. And that's there today. You can go and oh, yeah. look at that. Yeah, 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 yeah. We, we, we built eight uh, solar fields, one of our companies, wow. in Israel. And uh, as I was building the first one, all these people came from Africa and said, hey, Startup Nation, can you help us? Wow, wow. So how, how did they come? They heard about it? or? Yeah, well, we, we had done our deal with Siemens, which is a major company, and so right. got a lot of press. Um, I think it's a combination of having Siemens and having it come from Israel, which many people consider a land of miracles, not just past, but also present and hopefully future. Uh, and I think that combination really 
put us in the consciousness of a, of a lot of uh, developing countries. Um, now, you know, there are going to be people from Africa watching and okay. they're immediately going to start to want to know. But if, yeah. if you we're going to jump the gun a little bit and just yeah. say if they if they want to connect with the company, is that better from a governmental position? In other words, that they get in touch with their we're, representative? You know, or, we're happy to hear from governments, energy ministries. That's uh, the best way to contact. But also entrepreneurs that have land and right. Uh, right. you know are near a grid or know how to work. I hope they won't flood your uh, email All box. Right, well, uh, <laughs> Yosef at energiaglobal.com, and, so, and you can follow me on Captain Sunshine with a K wow. on Twitter, and I'll, I'll answer messages there. Um, so uh, how did that? So they they came from Africa, but it's yeah. one thing for them to come and look, but it's another thing for you to go over there and yeah. look at the. Yeah, look, I, I actually was pretty naive. I thought it was a little bit of cut and paste. I thought it was more than a little bit. It turned out to only be a little bit because you really have to adapt to the politics, the culture, the needs. Um, you always need a very strong, trusting local team that I used to say that we would have to trust with our good name. And some places you have to trust with your life. I mean, we're right. working. The most vulnerable people in Africa right. are sometimes in the hardest places to deploy safely. Right. And there are 600 million Africans without access to power. Wow. 600 million. We figured yeah. it out, actually. It's uh, staggering and uh, the inequality. And uh, you, I guess, really, you have to be there to see it. You know, yeah. we worked in Africa, so, so we saw that. We yeah. saw the, the difference, the, the, you know. And um, we realized that for us, when we were a family over there, we can make a difference in our with, our lo with the locals or with the yeah. people who are with us. But it's yeah. difficult to change a whole. But what you're doing is changing a whole way of living because suddenly they've got light. I mean, the whole yeah. thing, there's a couple of things in Africa. Yeah. There's um, lighting because you can't, you know, we had power sharing when we were in Uganda and so you can't work if there's no light. Right. And then um, uh, water, clean and fresh water. That's right. That's right. So for us, it's really about uplifting human dignity. How right. do you affirm and uplift human dignity? How do you supply power, not just for light, which is important. We we are commanded to spread some light, so we're happy to. But for what we call productive use, how, how does it bring economic development, both in a country level, but we also work in communities. Whatever community that will be able to do a commercial scale solar field, we do different kinds of economic development um, activities. So so the the people, everybody benefits. You need everyone to benefit because wow. they're used to just people coming from Europe and only the Europeans benefiting. And uh, well, that's not our philosophy or, right. or our theology. Now, you've done a video uh, of your work, a company uh -huh. video, yeah. uh, and uh, it shows the work. So we're going to just have a quick look at that now. Wow, I hope you enjoyed that. It's a very, very interesting, you know, amazing video of the work you're doing in Rwanda and around the world uh, with solar energy. Now, I understand that you also have a connection with the U2 rock band. <laughs> Some of you may, have, may you know, a lot of them will know who U2 are, but yeah. it, they're a, rock, a famous rock band from, from England. Well, from Ireland, actually, to indeed, be accurate. Indeed, indeed. Um, 
So no one had ever succeeded in building a utility scale solar in sub-Sahara Africa. So I guess, it was a, I guess it was a big enough deal that uh, Bana has been a, really a friend uh, of Africa for decades. Uh, he does a lot of humanitarian work. Yeah. An amazing amount. Uh, and it's not just surface. He knows more than, than most policymakers. Uh, and so we were honored that uh, he helped uh, inaugurate uh, this field wow. in Rwanda, which is supplying 6% of the country's uh, energy needs in one field at the Agohozo oh, Shalom wow. Youth Village. It's at an wow. orphan youth village built on the Israeli models of youth village after the Holocaust. And um, we get to cover the, all the medical costs of 500 orphans who go through so the Every So the year. solar field is, 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 is creating power for the nation in an environmentally friendly way. And it's Indeed. also providing an income to help sustain the Yeah, uh, work. all the medical wow. costs for 500 orphans. Are, wow. These are the echoes of the genocide that and they're being taken right. care of there. Right. But we're, you know, we're a for-profit company with a quadruple bottom line. Like, okay, great, it has to be yeah. economically viable. I was going to ask you that. Yeah. That, uh, you're watching from Africa and you're saying, this is all great and fantastic, yeah. but yeah. we can't afford, we don't have any money to, you know, they don't have the finance so for that. So we, we have phenomenal backing of the U.S. government, uh, the British government, uh, African Development Bank, uh, Israeli government and others. This is important for the world to happen, for there to be access to electricity in some of the poorest places on the planet. And so we bring 100% financing. That's wow. not the issue, wow. but we, we need to be able to have a long-term contract with the country mm -hmm. so that there are revenues and that there are some profits. We're always looking for humanitarian benefit and environmental benefit and also some sort of geostrategic, some you know, advanced Israeli diplomacy, for example, wow. in Africa. Yeah, because um, that's another issue. Uh, yeah. One of the things is, is that uh, Israel is working, um, Netanyahu has gone out of his way to uh, to work with African countries. There was a, they were hoping to have an African summit, which sadly had to be canceled. But there's been a lot of work. Netanyahu has been making uh, a lot of advances for Israel in, yeah. into Africa. Look, when Israel was a very young nation, Golda Meir was the foreign minister. And for her, these new nations that were coming off of colonialism were like little Israel coming off of colonialism. And there was a lot... Uh, of love, actually, a lot of technical assistance that was shared for decades, um, and a quarter of the votes in the UN are from Africa. So wow. we're, in a sense, picking up Golda Meir's legacy with a business model. Um, we're also open to individual investors from uh, you know the Christian world, uh, and and it also advances uh, you know good diplomatic goals. So on the practical scale, do you have to train? Because you build the solar field, but uh, yeah. I guess that there's maintenance and security and other issues. Do you have to train a group uh, in Africa to take responsibility for the... Yeah, very much so. Like w what happens with development aid, often like somebody well-meaning will come in and build something and then three years later it doesn't work, right? Right. Here there's a maintenance contract and we do local training. We do what's called knowledge transfer, capacity building. Um, we come with a, the philosophy and a theology of partnership. The Chinese will come, do it, and, you know, and, and, and leave. That is not our way. We're, this is a long-term relationship, and we want jobs to, to be as local as possible. So do you, do you take uh, Israeli technicians or American mm -hmm. technicians into the field, and they yeah. train a, a group of people? Absolutely, and we'll also bring African students who are qualified here to Israel, from the countries in which we're working, and they'll be trained uh, at the Arava Institute down at Kibbutz Keturah in solar power. So, yes, yeah, Arava is the f company you formed to start the p solar thing in yes. Israel from so the Arava beginning. So, Arava Power is the first company we did, which wow. does the solar fields here. But we also have an institute, an NGO, that teaches environmentalism right next to our solar fields. And now, they, I read uh, that there's a, a tower, a solar tower yeah. with a solar Indeed. area that, in Israel. Yeah, th this notion that you can get electricity out of light is miraculous, right? And there's two ways to make electricity from the power of the sun. One is through heat and one is through light. We tend to use light. Right. Uh, but when you have a tower and you have mirrors projecting 
sunlight on a tower to heat something up and eventually makes steam and turns a turbine. That's an Israeli invention uh, And it's well. the tallest in the world, like somebody I read in the... the tallest solar tower right. in the world, indeed. Wow, indeed. wow. So, so now in Israel, you've seen yeah. a change. I guess there's solar fields now in other places or so, in Israel? Uh, yes and no. Uh, right. Here's the bad news. The bad news is Israel is only about 3% powered by the sun. We'll right. get to about 10% in the next couple of years, and we don't have very ambitious goals. Here's the miraculous news. When we moved to Israel and we came up with this idea, we had a wildly unrealistic goal that from the Red Sea, mm -hmm. Eilat, to the Dead Sea, we're like, let's get to be 100% powered by the sun during the day by 2020. Wow. And the electric company said it's impossible, 10 20%. Politicians were against. There's no precedent on the planet. Today we're at 70%, and at 2020 we'll be 100% powered by the sun during the day. And that's the model that we right. want to gift to the world. You mean that all of Israel's electricity is? No, just from the Red Sea to the Dead Sea. So the port city of Eilat, oh, all okay. the hotels, and but right. that's but, but that's already a but that start. should be that's a great right. start. Somebody had to take this leap of faith. Right. and make it happen. So we want what's true for the southern part of Israel to be true for all of Israel and for this to be true for our neighbors and yeah. throughout Africa. One of the things I noticed when we came here, uh, when we came to, to live in Israel, was that we see solar panels on roofs. Uh -huh. Do you think that's something that's increasing or is it about the same? You yeah. know, because there's what I would call private solar power that, you know, for residential and... Right. Israel's number one on what's called solar thermal, meaning your hot water uh, is from the sun. Right. Um, right now, there's a new program to put um, photovoltaic cells to make also electricity. So we're hoping that's going to take off in a, in a big way. Um, look, we're, we have a unique security situation here. But if our grid goes down because of missiles, cyber attack, earthquakes, um, the more people who have solar pan panels and as well as battery, we have right. to get the battery regulation up to speed. Um, it's for everyone's, I think, energy security uh, that more and more solar panels should be on people's roofs. You were a candidate for president. Are you thinking of standing in, or going into politics at some stage, or is that? It, it, to me, it wasn't about day. politics. It's a symbolic post in the state of Israel. Right. And we very much wanted the presidency to represent two things in the world. One is Israeli innovation for healing the world, right? And my wife's a rabbi, and, uh, and we wanted Israel to be seen as a spiritual home of, um, of all Jews. Uh, and we have a bit of a religious uh, monopoly issue here in this country. Well, right. um, so that was to, essentially to make a statement. We'll see how well the solar goes in the next three years. <laughs> And then uh, you, you, you'll, you'll Maybe have we'll be back. at the presidential. The next interview we do with you will be at your presidential. Uh, that sounds good. It's a deal. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank and we'll you. be back right after this. Shalom, the friends. Wonderful to be with you. We are refreshing ourselves today and we are looking a bit more and remembering about the Hebrew language and the letters and all these things. Now, when we look at that, we can see also like every letter has a name, it has also a numerical number, and it also has a meaning. Now, when today we are going to look, for example, a name to give you an example. The name is Adam, and Adam is made of three letters, Aleph, Dalet, and Mem. Aleph is one, and it represents the creator, the master. Then you have Dam, Dalet, and Mem, and Dam means blood. So when you see with the name of Adam, we are made in the image of God and we have blood in us. Now, interesting enough, when you look in Genesis uh, 2, when God created Adam, Adam was made, he was male and female. So when we say Adam as a man is more human being, like humankind, okay? So again, we are going, we speak about the numbers and you are going to see some beautiful things with that. Adam, we say Aleph is one, Dalet four, and Mem is 40. So when you put Dam together, it's 44 plus the Aleph, 145. Now you just think, whoa, you know what? We are made in the image of God. And when a man with a woman create a baby, the man give 23 chromosomes and the women give 23. And it makes a new human being, which is a 46 chromosome. 
So you can see with dam, 44, you divide, the, you divide it by 2 and it's 22. So you have the 22 plus the 1 of the creator for the side of the man. And after 22 and 1 for the creator, 23 for the women. And it makes the baby 46 chromosome. It's just amazing to see that. So when we see that we are made in the image of God, and we really understand that, in, integrate it really in our way of thinking, you can see that you can, you can really respect whoever was next to you, like a different way of thinking, different religion, different country, different language. It's like we are all, as human beings, made in the image of God. And so we, we can elevate each other. We can see the image of God in the other one. And there is a deep respect who can come and we leave the place to the other one to be who he is. And like there is a saying which is beautiful, which is um, the one who say, who save a soul, save a whole universe. So we are a whole universe in ourselves and we have to leave the place to the other one to be who they are. And there is another one, another saying, and I really want to leave it with you, that one, and to meditate on it because it's beautiful and very profound and is again elevating yourself to know who you are. It is this saying, the day you were born is the day God decided the world could not exist without you. Isn't it beautiful? And we can sing about it during the week. And I will see you next week again. Bye. Well, thank you so much uh, for coming into the studio, sharing about uh, the fantastic developments in Africa that Israel is pioneering. Hope you uh, enjoyed that. Don't forget to share it with your friends. Visit their website, which is on the screen now. And uh, if you'd like to email us, the email address is info at israelfirst.org. Visit the website www.israelfirst.org. And remember, we're the program that looks at the land, the people, and the language.